great to see you all here today. Thank you, Harmony and worship team, for leading us. Uh, thank all of you for singing together. We're going to talk today about a subject that probably is one of the most challenging in our Christian journey, and that is the subject of faith. And if I were to go around and ask you for your definition of faith, I'd probably get as many different definitions as there are people in this room. Because I think we all have, each of us have different understanding and nuances about what faith means. And my, my desire in this message today, as we look at Abraham and Sarah's life, is to help each of us come to maybe a fresh understanding of faith and to possibly correct some misconceptions. Because I think the thing about faith is that when we have misunderstandings about it and things we struggle with, it really can hinder our relationship with the Lord. It hinders our trust in God, our belief that he answers prayer, our understanding that he's with us. And so my hope is that as we look at Abraham and Sarah's lives, we'll be able to see more clearly the true nature of faith and what it means for us to walk in relationship with God and trusting in him. The Bible hero we're looking at today, as I've said, is Abraham along with his wife Sarah. Genesis devotes 14 chapters to Abraham and Sarah's life. And then they're mentioned multiple times in the New Testament as well. The New Testament designates Abraham as the father of faith. And the Apostle Paul makes clear in Romans chapter 4 that it's Abraham's faith in God that leads him to be remembered as the father of faith for all people, both Jews and Gentiles. Abraham's faith is legendary. We first meet him in Genesis chapter 12, just after the Tower of Babel fiasco which saw a group of people attempt to construct a tower that could reach the heavens so they could make a name for themselves. God stymied their plan by giving them a variety of languages and spreading them across the earth. Similar to Noah, whom we looked at last week, God spoke to Abram, that was his name originally when we first meet him, seemingly out of nowhere. And here are God's words to Abram in Genesis chapter 12, reading verses 1 through 5. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. I want to look more closely at what's happening here. God calls Abram and his wife Sarah to leave the safety and security of everything they knew to go to an unknown place that God was going to show them. God promised to make Abram and Sarai into a great nation which he would bless, and he said that through them the entire world would be blessed as well. Now following creation and Adam and Eve and the fall, and after the flood and the Tower of Babel, God was in some ways starting afresh with Abram and Sarah. Now I'm just going to say on the front end, eventually Abram's name is changed to Abraham, and Sarai is changed to Sarah, to represent that they were going to be the father of many nations and the mother of many nations. And so, for simplicity's sake, I'm going to call them Abraham and Sarah for this point on. It doesn't actually change until midway through their story, but rather than going back and forth, I'm just going to continue to refer to them as Abraham and Sarah. At the time Abraham heard God, his family was polytheists, meaning they worshipped a whole pantheon of gods. They Worship the gods of the sun and the moon and the stars and the rivers and the mountains. As God revealed himself to Abraham and later to the Jewish people, he was adamant that he's the only God, not one among many. He's the only God. The worship of God alone uniquely identified the Jewish people as monotheists. A solitary God was a radical concept to the people of that era. And it would practically been inconceivable to Abraham and Sarah. But when God called, we read that Abraham responded and he followed God 
to the place he was directed to. In this initial introduction to Abraham, we're told that he was 75 years old. We later learn that his wife Sarah was 65. Now their age may not seem that unusual until we understand that God's plan was for Sarah to conceive, deliver, and raise a child in her old age. And that one, that's when it starts to get interesting. I mean, if I were to ask you how many of you are 75, a number of hands would go up, or 65, that's no big deal. But if I were to tell you that at 65 and 75 you're going to conceive a child uh, and raise that child, th then we get into a whole different territory, right? And so that's what's going on with Abraham and Sarah. Abraham took everyone and everything he owned and he followed God. And he's known as the father of faith. But as we'll see, his faith wavered frequently. And that's what I want us to take hope and encouragement from. That Abraham, who's known as the father of faith, clearly had times when his faith wavered. In ways that are going to make us kind of scratch our heads and say, this guy's the one who's known as the father of faith? And I think the encouragement in that is, if Abraham is known as the father of faith, that says to me, I can have some missteps and failures and and mess up and still be a person of faith as well. And to me, that gives a lot of encouragement and hope. Any of you identify with that? Because all of us, if we're honest, have those, have those missteps. Here's a couple of Abraham's missteps. In the course of his travels, we're told about two times when he was so afraid for his life that he convinced his wife Sarah to tell everyone that she was his sister. Sarah was apparently very, very beautiful, and Abraham believed as they went into these different countries that the king of those places were going to be attracted to her and would want to take her as part of their harem. And that if Abraham was identified as her husband, that would probably mean off with his head. And somehow he thought that if he was her brother, then he would be actually respected and his life would be preserved. And so that happens in Egypt in chapter uh, 12. And then again in chapter 20 it happens in a place called Gerar, Gerar. They go into this place, they tell everybody that they're brother and sister. The king says, ah, oh, this is a beautiful woman, I'm going to bring her into my harem. Abraham is actually protected and blessed. Sarah is taken into the harem. And then in one case God reveals to the king, you better not touch her, she's actually his wife. In another place, Abraham and Sarah think they're uh, off by themselves somewhere and they're showing affection to each other and the king sees them and realizes they're not brother and sister, they're husband and wife. So in each case, Abraham tries to protect himself by basically putting his wife in a very difficult place. God protects her so that she's not harmed and the kings who could have had both their heads for that lie... Uh, in one condition, in one place, God actually said, don't lay a hand on them. And the king says, the only reason I'm not harming you, Abraham, is because your God told me I better let you go. So, be gone. But I mean, that, so that doesn't exactly exhibit a lot of faith, right? Now, we also see uh, Abraham's doubt and lack of trust in God's protection may seem odd for a man known as the father of faith. But as we emphasized last week, weakness is the experience of every one of us as humans. The designation sinner and saint coexist in all of us who have placed our faith in Jesus. In fact, it's precisely because of our frailty that God gains glory through our lives. As the Apostle Paul points out in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God, not from us. In other words, God works in an amazing way through our lives, not so we gain credit and people say, oh, Lane's a great guy, or, or Quincy's a great guy, or, or Haley's a great woman. That's not the purpose. God shows himself through us and works through us as frail people so that he gains glory for himself. Tyler Statton, in his book, Praying Like Monks, had this great quote, again, that I shared last week. To call someone a saint in the Bible is not necessarily to call them good. 
It's only to name them as someone who has experienced the goodness of God. So if I'm going to go around and to you and say, hey, who's good? You're saints. Some of you might pass the test, although if we dig a little deeper, maybe not. But if I say which of you has experienced the goodness of God, then we all can qualify. Now, that's the Bible's definition of a saint. Those who have experienced the goodness of God. And the encouraging thing to me is, I can experience that, you can experience that. I don't have to attain to some high standard of living to, to be able to experience God's goodness. I emphasized it last week, and I'm sure we'll reiterate it throughout the series. We're highlighting the failures, shortcomings, and sins of these Bible characters, not to play into the common hobby of our day of smearing leaders, but to emphasize that none of us, even the holiest saints, are perfect, and God still uses imperfect people like you and like me to accomplish his purposes. Again, to, to paraphrase Tyler Statton, we're saints not because of our own inherent goodness, but because we've experienced the grace and forgiveness and goodness of God. Despite Abraham's faith failures, he's known as the father of faith, and in spite of our failures, God can be glorified in our lives too. We also see Abraham and Sarah's lack of faith about God's promise to make them parents in their old age. Now to be fair, Abraham and Sarah were apparently too old to become parents. They were 75 and 65 years of age when God spoke to Abraham and said, you're going to be the father of many nations. And they were 190 years of age when Isaac, the child of promise, was finally born. And knowing their age, I think it's easy to understand why it was difficult for them to have faith that God was going to do what he said in that area. In chapter 15, Abraham and Sarah were having their doubts. God appeared to Abraham in a vision, reaffirmed his promise, but Abraham responded, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? You have given me no children, so a servant in my household is going to be my heir. In response, God took Abraham outside at night, and he showed him all the stars. He said, look up into the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, so shall your offspring be. And if you didn't get a chance to look at our art gallery back there, uh, someone, and I forget who, has actually made an art piece of Abraham outside looking up at the stars surrounding him. God said, that's how many children you're going to have, how many offspring you'll have. In Genesis 15, 5, we're told, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Time moved on. Abraham's now 85. Sarah's 75. This time, Sarah's faith wavered, and she went to Abraham and said, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, Abraham, it's clear that God needs some help because we're moving along in age and we still don't have a child. So why don't you take, which was a common practice in that day, take my, my servant, my handmaiden, Hagar, and have a child through her. And so Abraham agreed. Uh, nine months later or so, they had a child named Ishmael. So they could, you know, kind of help God out. Aside from attempting to fulfill God's promise in a way other than what God intended, Ishmael's birth created jealousy between Sarah and her servant. And later, Ishmael and his people became rivals to God's people, the Israelites. Four years later, after Ishmael was born, Abraham, now 99, Sarah, 89, still no child. God appeared to Abraham and he told him that in a year, he and Sarah were going to be parents. Abraham fell on his face before God and laughed. And he said, will a son be born to a man who is 100 years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? If only Ishmael might live under your promise. And again, it's like, we already have a child, God. We've got Ishmael. Like, can't he be the one that you fulfill the promise through? And God says, I'll bless Ishmael, but you and Sarah are going to have a son. And shortly after this, three heavenly visitors visited Abraham and Sarah. 
to tell them they'd have a son within a year. And when Sarah heard this, she too laughed inside of her tent. The divine beings asked, why did Sarah laugh? Is anything too hard for the Lord? And just as God promised, a year later, Abraham was 100, Sarah was 90, and they had a baby boy named Isaac. And the name Isaac means laughter. A fitting name because both of them at different points along the way had laughed in response to God's promise that they were going to be the father and mother of many nations. That's our father of faith. Again, I find that encouraging. Because it says to me, my faith doesn't have to be perfect and unwavering to be seen by God as a person of faith. Time passed and Isaac grew. We don't know exactly how old he was, but scholars guess he's somewhere maybe around 8 to 12. Abraham refers to him in this account as the boy when talking to his servants, but he was old enough to carry a load of wood for the fire. So we're going to say he's somewhere in that 8 to 12 range. And I want to read, um, I'm going to read verse, chapter 22, which really lays out the story well of what took place, uh, reading up to verse 18. Sometime later, God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, You stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. I want to I highlight Abraham's faith here. We will worship, and we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went together on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son Abraham replied, the fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. I just want to pause there. Can you imagine the emotions that Abraham's feeling as he, as son asked that question as they, as they journey together? When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns he went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed, because you have obeyed me. Admittedly, God's instruction to Abraham to sacrifice his son is disturbing. It kind of caught me by surprise, but even as I read that aloud to you, I get emotional just thinking about what's taking place there. In the culture of that day, child sacrifice was the common religious practice one that God later strictly forbade his people from engaging in. We can only speculate on the emotions that Abraham felt when God gave him that command. Child fact, sacrifice would be unthinkable for any father, but especially because Isaac was the child of promise whom Abraham and Sarah had waited for for 25 years. 
Like many of the Old Testament stories, the narrative moved quickly with only minimal details. But we see that Abraham was obedient and prepared to sacrifice Isaac up until the point when the angel of the Lord commanded him to stop. In spite of Isaac being the one through whom God had said he would fulfill the promise of Abraham and Sarah, being the father and mother of nations, Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son. Now the details were given in Genesis, again, are pretty minimal. But fortunately, more of the gaps are filled in for us in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul spends the entire chapter of Romans 4 putting Abraham's faith in God in context for us. And in chapter 11 of Hebrew, the Hebrews, uh, the Bible's hall of faith, we read these amazing words. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. This is the powerful part. Abraham reasoned, that God could even raise the dead, and so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. It's an amazing account that I read to you from Genesis 22. Abraham's taking Isaac, his son, following God's instructions to sacrifice him. The the boy says, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says, God will provide. And then as he leaves the servants behind, he said, wait for us, we'll be back. And yet when they arrive and no sacrifice is present, he binds Isaac and places him on the wood and starts to prepare to sacrifice him when God tells him to stop. And so when the New Testament author looks back at that, he says, Abraham apparently believed that God could even raise Isaac from the dead. It's incredible faith. I think there we begin to see why God calls him the man of faith. God's testing of Abraham appears to solidify for Abraham the understanding that his faith and trust lay in God, not in Isaac as the fulfillment of the promise that he and Sarah would be the father and mother of nations. Abraham's faith had been shaky and uncertain in the past, but in this instant, Abraham fully placed his trust in God. And the author of Hebrews, again, goes so far as to say he believed God that he could even raise Isaac from the dead and fulfill the promise through him. The stories of the Old Testament men and women we're exploring throughout this series are fascinating. But I don't want us to stop at being intrigued by their stories. Each week I want us to think about what implications do these characters' lives and the way they walked with the Lord and the way they responded to the circumstances of life, what implications do those things have for us? As we reflect on Abraham and Sarah's lives, I want to begin with an insight that I believe needs to be reinforced for every one of us about the nature of faith. I'm convinced that many of us, because of the doubts and uncertainties that we perceive in ourselves, then jump to the inclusion that we therefore lack faith. I'm convinced that because of our doubts and uncertainties, many of us arrive at that place. And it's important to understand that being a person of faith doesn't preclude us from having doubts and taking missteps. Faith, as we see in Abraham's life, is ultimately trusting that God is who he says he is and he will do what he says he'll do, despite our doubts and at times even our unbelief. This is really important. Faith isn't the absence of fear or doubt. Because if we're honest, if we're honest, then none of us are people of faith if we never have doubts or unbelief. That's part of our human condition. Faith is pushing ahead in obedience to God in spite of our fears, our doubts, and our unbelief. The first question I'd like each of us to reflect on is this, do I live as a person of faith? Just last week, I emphasized the importance of viewing ourselves as saints rather than sinners because we'll live up to the picture that we have of ourselves. 
I'm not going to go into a psychological study. Uh, I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but we live into the identity that we have of ourselves. That's a pretty well-known fact for everyone. I mean, pretty common understanding. We live into how we view ourselves. If we view ourselves as a sinner, our lives are going to reflect that. If we view ourselves as a saint, with God's help, we'll, we'll live into that. In a similar way, I think it's critical that we view ourselves as people of faith, not people of unbelief. Focusing on God's power and his promises, rather than fixating on our own human frailty and unbelief. Secondly, as we consider Abraham's story, it appears that God's command to him to sacrifice Isaac was to ensure that Abraham's faith was firmly placed in God, not in Isaac or anyone or anything else. And so my question that comes to mind for myself and for you is, are there obstacles in our lives that get in the way of us fully placing our trust in God? And these can be good things. I mean, Isaac was a great thing. It was a promise that God had given to Abraham and Sarah after 50 years, uh, 25 years of waiting. Often these obstacles can be good things. Our spouse, children, job, money, nice possessions, future dreams, fill in the blank. But are there obstacles in our lives that get in the way of us fully placing our our faith in God? Things that we've come, maybe even good things that God has given us, that we then transfer our faith in God to this thing and say, now I have this, I'm secure. I'm, I'm confident. I'm, I'm grounded and rooted. And we lose sight of the fact that our faith is actually in God, not in the gifts or the blessings that he's given us. As a follow-up question to that about obstacles, if the Holy Spirit identifies obstacles, am I willing to submit those to God and his care so that my faith fully rests in him? If God's identifying those things that we've kind of transferred faith in him to faith in this, am I willing to lay that before God and say, God, you've convicted me, you've pointed this out to me, you're actually the one in whom my faith needs to rest, not this thing that you've blessed me with, maybe even this answer to prayer that you've given me. Finally, what is God asking you to trust him for? Perhaps there's something that you sense he's been telling you for a long time. In Matthew chapter 7, we're encouraged to ask, seek, and knock. And Jesus' promise to us is that as we ask, we'll find. As we seek, he'll answer. As we knock, the door will be opened. Is there something the Holy Spirit is pointing to in your life or in my life that he wants you to trust him for? And I realize these are really difficult questions and... um, I want you to understand that I'm not standing up here, even though I am on an elevated platform. I'm here so you can see me, not as one who has arrived. Please don't call me a father of faith. I'm walking the same way as you are. Uh, I'm just trying to share what God's been putting on my heart as we look at Abraham's life. Abraham and Sarah are renowned for their faith. And yet faith for them wasn't a straight line in which God communicated something And they unwaveringly walked that line directly into receiving his promise. Their journey went like this and like this, much more than it went like this. Abraham and Sarah's faith journey was filled with twists and turns and marked by their doubts and uncertainties. I identify with that kind of faith. I'm happy that Abraham's called a man of faith in spite of some of those twists and turns. I relate to the father we read about in Mark's gospel, chapter 9, who had a son who was possessed by an evil spirit. He took him to the disciples, and they weren't able to get rid of the evil spirit, and so he finally comes to Jesus. Jesus had been away, and he says, Jesus, uh, here's my son. He's possessed by an evil spirit. Um, Can you help him? And Jesus said, everything is possible for one who believes. And I love the dad's response. I do believe, help my unbelief. 
And I love that because I think it's a great picture of where many of us often are. I know where I'm often at. God, I, I do believe, I trust you, I see what you've done in the past, I see what you've done in my own life, I see how you've worked in other people's lives, I do believe, but help my unbelief. I think all of us identify with that. And I think God welcomes that. He welcomes the honesty and the trust. He wants us to place our faith in him. And the thing I love about that story, Jesus healed his son. Jesus didn't say, hey, go away for a couple weeks, pray and fast, read your Bible more, and if you have better faith, come back and I'll heal your son. None of this helped my unbelief. Go take care of that, then you come back and I'll answer your prayer. Jesus healed his son. I'm encouraged that by that encounter, because the father's struggle to believe didn't preclude him from seeing Jesus heal his son. It appears that as we walk with Jesus, he chooses to strengthen our belief in him so that our faith grows. And so here's kind of my prayer for you, and I invite the worship team to come up. As I thought about summing this up, may we be people who place our faith in God and trust him based on who we know him to be and on what he said he will do. And like Abraham and Sarah, may we receive the fulfillment of our Heavenly Father's promises in our lives. That was a long run-on sentence, kind of like Paul writes if you read the New Testament. So I'm going to read that again. May we be people who place our faith in God and trust him based on who we know him to be and on what he has said he will do. And, like Abraham and Sarah, may we receive the fulfillment of our Heavenly Father's promises in our lives. That's my hope for me. It's my hope for all of you. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for your grace, for your patience. Lord, I confess, and I think I confess on behalf of everyone here, that our faith wavers. We do struggle with unbelief and doubt. You can do an amazing thing for us one day and a week later or a year later, sometimes even a day later, we have anxiety again about whether you're going to do what you said you'd do, whether we can trust you. I thank you for your patience and your grace, and I pray that you would continue to grow me and to grow us as people of faith. And like Abraham and Sarah, may we see the fulfillment of your promises in our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name, and together we say, amen. amen.